Okay, now we got to get into some of the details about what this meter is. Because what you just saw in the prior increment, which is the first of the new uh, current history, 1960 to 2041, what you just saw is probably pretty disturbing, and you should be skeptical. The reason why I believe it is because I've been working on this for eight years. You haven't seen it until maybe now, so you're probably going to think, oh yeah, right. It's okay to be skeptical. The bigger question is whether or not it's actually true. If it were true that what I said in that first video about 1960 through 2041, how could I prove that to you without having to spend eight years of your time proving it? I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with logic. Because if you can prove a thing logically, then that makes it at least plausible that it's true. And if plausible, then it's worth your time to spend more time finding the proof, which is really rather technical. So we're going to start with logic. Logically, if God exists, then he would know your future. And logically, if God exists, he'd want to reveal himself in a manner that isn't going to freak you out. And if he's going to reveal himself, then he's got to do it in some way that's easy to remember and process. Just like when you're a kid. You don't know what mom and dad means. You see a face in front of you. And it does all these things that makes you feel good. And you come to want to see that face. Of course, the face is your mom, your dad, maybe your brothers and sisters, other people who really like you. And you don't even know the word like. You just know that when they're around you, you feel good. That's how you start. And then gradually, nobody knows really quite how, a baby learns to recognize sounds. And then it learns to recognize words. And then it learns to recognize sentences. And then it tries to repeat what it learns as words, as sentences. And then it learns to read one letter at a time, one word at a time, one sentence at a time. It learns to associate the words and sounds it learned with some marks on a page. And it eventually learns how to read those marks. And it eventually learns how to write those marks. Every child goes through this. I don't care where they're born or when they're born. Well, if that child is born at a time when it's difficult to carry around all of the reading that a people might have, then the child learns to memorize too. Learns to memorize the sound of the words. Learns to memorize, oh, a word that's one syllable. Wording, that's two syllables. And if it's memorizing lots of syllables that are the total of the words, it learns to count the syllables. We do that. We do that when we teach our children. In fact, we give them little songs. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Da, 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 da. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, seven. See? And that's how the rest of the song goes. Da 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 da. Notice how it's seven and seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's a common song we all learned in America. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. See? And it's done to a certain cadence. Well, if you want to memorize lots and lots of text, the same thing, like a song, is really helpful, huh? I mean, how many times have you heard part of a song? And that reminds you, oh yeah, I haven't heard that song in 20 years. And then you start to try to remember it. And you remember just a part of it. And then all of a sudden the rest of the song comes back to you. Why is that? Because it's structured in numbered syllables that have relevance to the words. And then it's easier to remember, even decades later. I bet you can remember songs that you learned when you were 10. So how much more useful would it be if whole big groups of text, epics, or the Bible was written that way? Then it'd be easier to remember. Yeah. And that's how the Bible is written. Only the scholars don't know that yet. I found it by accident eight years ago. It's written in sevens. Just like I started to say, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Now, it's not always seven syllables in a phrase, in a clause. Sometimes it's 20. Sometimes it's 50. Sometimes it's 32. But... At the beginning, probably of each chapter, I haven't done all of them yet, but I've done all the first chapters of the New Testament, and I've done some big sections of the Old. At the beginning of each chapter, it's sevens. And it's like, oh, why is that? And it's a particular kind of number that has to do with the text. Oh, that's like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Now, pretend that you were living during the time that the Bible was being written. And that writing style, because that's really what it is, a writing style, of counting the syllables and writing words in exactly a way that it could be easily remembered. Kind of like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's not a rhyme. It's not a poem. But it's easily remembered. Because it's got a certain cadence. And the clause, as it were, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, ends up being something that you easily associate with the actual letters or words of the text. Now, if you were living in Bible times, because it was so hard to carry those big scrolls with you, you learned to memorize the text that way. And if you learned it, then you passed on that same memorization technique to your kids. And just like you and I learn A, B, C, D, E, F, G, when we're children, so to children during Bible times learned huge parts of the Bible as it was then being written out so that it was something like child's play to them. They didn't have smartphones or computers. They spent most of their time doing something with their hands. And when you do something with your hands, 
doesn't it get really tiring if you don't have something else you can do with your mind? If you have to do something repetitive with your hands, you're not going to want to do it very long before you think, you know what, I, I want to have some music to play or turn the TV on. And if you can't do either of those things, you try to think about something else while you're doing the repetitive thing with your hands. Well, what do you think ancient children did? What do you think ancient adults did? It gets really boring if you have to just bend down, pick up, because you're picking, you know, you're harvesting something. Bend down, pick up, bend down, pick up, bend down, pick up, bend down, pick up. And if you think back, not that far back, to like the late 1800s here in America, a lot of people did that. In fact, a whole lot of songs came out of that from the Black South. And Harry Belafonte, who was, you know, newly famous when I was growing up, he turned those songs into very popular songs that we all learned when we were kids. Jump down, spin around, pick a bale, got and got to jump down, spin around, pick a bale today. I haven't thought of that song in maybe 30 years. They made up songs in order to, you know, make it easier and more fun to do what they were doing. Okay, well, in Bible times, people would play with scripture like that. And scripture was written like that so that they could play those games. So they could think of scripture while they did what they did. It was even a command in the Bible. When you get up... And when you go to sleep, Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 30, go read it yourself. Well, how hard would that be if we had to use what we have? Not too easy. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's really hard to memorize scripture. It always seems to be saying the same thing and the words are so fuzzy. Well, but they're not fuzzy in the original. They're very witty. And they're timed. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And the first place where that timing occurs is in Genesis. Moses writes Genesis using 1050 syllables by the time we end our chapter in English. And it's 1144 syllables by the time the chapter actually ends in Hebrew. That's pretty important because all throughout the Bible, all the dates in the Bible are structured around 1050. Now the Jews learned that. And you can prove that they had learned that first because you count the syllables and you see this pattern starting in Genesis 1. But even their memory of learning it the way I just described, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, in sevens, their memory of that survives in a sort of garbled format, which you'd expect it to be garbled after 3,000 years. But it survives in the Talmud. There's a book, well, it's not really a book, it's part of, because the Talmud's really a very sophisticated um, analysis of scripture plus the you know sayings of the sages and it's pictorial when you look at the actual text of the of the Talmud but it's been converted into just plain text that you can read at rabbinicaltraditions.com or just google on Talmud online and look up the book that's called Sanhedrin. Now, in the Talmud, it's sectioned off like they did ancient writings. And in Sanhedrin 97 through 99, you'll see that there's this, to most Christians, it looks odd, 2,000 years for the Goyim, 2,000 years for the Jews, and then Messiah comes. 
And then he has his own 2,000. And after that, history is supposed to end and the millennium is supposed to come, during which Israel is queen of the nations. And oh, by the way, Messiah is supposed to live 40 years, just like David ruled for 40 years. All that's in the Talmud. And all that's in the Bible, too. But you can't see it in the English. And it's not exactly 2,000 years. That's shorthand. It's really 1050. 1050 plus 1050 is 2100. 2100 for the Goyim, the Gentiles. And Abraham comes at the end of it. And at the end of the second 2100, which is 2100 years after Jacob was born, Christ was supposed to be born. And he ended up being born three and a half years early. But that's another story. The point is that all that stuff I just told you, which is in the Talmud, is actually in this A, B, C, D, E, F, G, sevening system of counting syllables in the Bible. And it starts in Genesis 1. Moses is writing Genesis 1 at the beginning of the 1051st year after the flood. How do I know that? Because as I told you a few seconds ago, or a few minutes ago, the first time the text is divisible by seven, the number of syllables, it tells you when the text is written. And it doesn't just do it once, it does it twice. So in Genesis, the first time the text is divisible by seven, counting the syllables, as any school kid is going to learn when he's like five years old, that's how you learn language, is what a syllable is. It's 63 syllables. The second time the text in Genesis 1 is divisible by 7 is when the total number of syllables is 119. And then it, the text goes on after that. And the total is 1050 by the time you get down to where we stop the chapter in English. And by the time you get to where it stops in Hebrew, it's 1144. So, now it's like, oh! So it's very deliberate, as you can see. I mean, just, you know, think about this like, okay, if what Brainout says is true, I should be able to count the syllables and verify this. Yeah, you should. And I did that. In Vimeo, I have a channel where I demonstrated all this in Genesis 1. It's called Genesis X Edge. And then you want to look on the page of that channel, it's Vimeo.com Brainout Channels, Genesis X Edge, E X E G, the last four characters. And then you want to look at that channel, which is like a playlist. Look for Remix, because that's where I start showing the counting of the syllables to show this 1050. You can download, there's a Word doc in there that's converted to PDF, you can download it and count the syllables yourself or have somebody who knows how to read Hebrew count them for you. And the videos go through what the counts all mean and how you can tell because the counting of the syllables relates to the text just like A, B, C, D, E, F, G so that the words are more memorable because of the count and the count is more meaningful because of the letters. So the counting relates to the text, and the text relates to the counting. So you know what the text means better because of the counting. Now, I've spent nearly 20 minutes just explaining that. The point to get out of this is that there is a counting of syllables style that's built right into the warp and woof of the Bible that helps you interpret the text 
and tells you when it's written. And it does a number of other things too. But just try to absorb the idea of that much. And then in the next increment, I'm going to try to show you how this works as a sort of live replay so that you can start to see, oh, there might be something valid to this argument that, oh, Matthew 24 and 25 is telling us about the Messiah 2000 and about the millennium, just like the Talmud talked about. Yeah, because it is. But I want to close with one thought. Why would God do this? Well, why do we have a Bible? To inform us about Him, about our future, about heaven, about how to live until we die? Yeah. So if you're living in a certain period of history and God foreknows what that's about, and there's something important to know about that section of history you're in, why wouldn't he tell you? It's not like he doesn't tell us how everything turns out. We call it prophecy. Now, what's prophecy for us was prophecy for the people during Bible times. But what was prophecy for them is past for us. So then that means, oh, we can go back through these timelines that do the 2,000 years for the Goyim, the 2,000 years for the Jews, and then Messiah comes. Well, then if we got that already in the Bible, we should be able to check it against history on an annual basis to see how accurately the Bible foretold time. Yeah, and you kind of have to do that. Because if you don't know the style of how it foretold the past, you won't be able to understand how it foretells the future. And that's what we're dealing with here. A style of telling you time. What time is it? Just like you look at your watch. So you can look at the Bible to know what time it is annually and as a believer you're supposed to know what time it is the Jews had to know and the Talmud shows that they did know something so now let's find out what that something is that's what this series is about now in the next increment I'm going to sort of role play what I just told you so you get a better sense of what it is and then we'll come back to Matthew 24 and 25. And I'll go through some more detail at that point. Peace out.